Hello, I'm George Green with Connections Lab. Ken Martin is a DNC Vice Chair, Chair of the Association of State Democratic Committees, and Chair of the Minnesota Democratic Farmer Labor Party. Ken is the first state party chair to include framing as a statewide priority, and he helped get Connections Lab where it is today. Ken is also the host of the DFL Debrief podcast, which you can find on the DFL website and major podcast services. If you're not from Minnesota, Google DFLMN. We missed the first few seconds, but the opening question was about the importance of framing in the Democratic Party. And we pick up Ken Martin just a few seconds in. Many more state parties and other activists around the country will uh, continue to adopt these techniques because it not only helps us, as I said, get the message out, but be as effective as possible. I also wanted to say a couple sort of caveats before I start. One, uh, I do have a crazy dog at home named Louie. He's a little puggle. And so if he starts barking, I apologize. Uh, yeah, but two, uh, many of you know, as I've said before, I have a plaque in my office that says none of us are as smart as all of us. And so I just want to say that, you know, um, I don't have all the answers. George and Lisa don't have all the answers. But I really believe that when we put our collective heads together, there's really nothing we can't figure out, both as a party and as people in this country. And so I really believe it's uh, important just to put that out there. You know, I, I've spent a lot of time in this role, as many of you know, uh, but I'm continuing to learn each and every day. So, you know, look, George asked an important question about what are the key messages that uh, we are talking about. And the, the the biggest piece is that Democrats are delivering. We're, we're delivering on vaccine vaccinations to, to defeat this pandemic with more shots in arms and vaccine rollouts throughout this country and, and policies that have kept us safe while allowing our businesses to uh, thrive and succeed during this pandemic and allow us to come out stronger because, because of it. We're delivering by providing resources to help struggling families and communities who've been knocked down by this pandemic and we're delivering so they can get back on their feet. We're delivering by investing in the future of this country by passing a jobs bill, which will build the middle class from the bottom up and the middle out while investing in critical infrastructure. And Dem Democrats are delivering on defeating fascism around that world. And yes, right here in this country. And so, you know, those are some of the top line messages uh, when we talk about uh, messaging. I often think about this in sort of three different buckets. And George, Lisa and I have talked about this. There's the, there's the narrative, the brand of what the Democratic Party is, uh, who we are, what we're fighting for and why. Many of those are our values. Uh, and then there's the message. Uh, and the message sometimes, depending on who's delivering it is going to be a little different, but it still fits underneath of that giant umbrella of our narrative and our brand as a Democratic Party. And then each candidate or each messenger uses different issues to illustrate, again, those values and, of course, which reinforces our, our narrative and our brand as a Democratic Party. And I think that's important because oftentimes people say to me, uh, wherever I go around the country, well, what is the Democratic message? And I always say, well, you tell me, what is the message that's going to work here in New Mexico, for instance, which is where I was this weekend, uh, or uh, out in Western Minnesota. And that's not to say that uh, we have different messages for different people, but there are different issues that are certainly more relevant to different parts of the state that help illustrate what our values are as a Democratic Party. And I think that's really important. So there's the brand and the narrative uh, that really is the umbrella. There's the message that should be specific to the candidate and the community, and then the issues underneath that uh, help uh, illustrate and animate those, those uh, messages. And so I, I think it's important, again, to, to note that what I just mentioned was really some of the top line messaging and, and narrative and branding that we're talking about as we go into 2022. But each district and each candidate's gonna have a slightly different uh, uh, set of issues that are gonna be used to help illustrate um, those, those general narrative points. We, uh, we actually, in the training, make a distinction between strategic and tactical messaging which is the same thing in different words. And the idea, you know, in tactical messaging, we have to do what we need to do right now to win this election. But it's also just the simple, uh, it's, it's the simple uh, understanding that when you're out knocking on doors, there are going to be issues that are specific to the, the particular area you're in. Uh, with the van now, we know a little bit about the voter. We can tailor our, our messages to the voter some degree. And those are the things we do in the moment. And 
but we also talk about strategic messaging, which is uh, being able to talk about it's more the brand stuff. It's the values it, which we all share. And if you look at polling and believe polling, most Americans share along with us. That's like right. they love the ACA, they hated Obamacare kind of thing. And so uh, the, the, the more we do that, the more we, we talk about our core values and the ones that, that we share with others, that helps lay a foundation over time so that when our candidates arrive at the door, it's not a big surprise to anybody what they're talking about. We actually make our messages the ones that are, are the most important. Uh, I kind of call it the glue that, that unites our, policy, our messages together. And yeah. it's something, uh, there's it also the, uh, the, the deal with, with uh, Manat uh, Schenker um, uh, Mosario. Manat, and Manat she Schenker, talks, uh, yep. Yeah, and she's, she's pretty awesome. And she, she talks about um, uh, kind of what I call a prefix. So the race class narrative, she adds to the beginning of that, no matter who you are, where you're from, and, uh, and, and whatever color you are, all of those kind of things for the race class narrative, that can go in front of any message. Yeah, and let, and let me say, George, I mean, I, I've talked with uh, Anat a lot about the race class narrative over the years. And really, um, my former mentor and boss and friend, uh, 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 Paul Wellstone, who I had the privilege to start in politics with, with and work for, uh, really really was talking about this before it was termed the race class narrative because Paul used to talk about uh, politics through this message frame of not being left or right in terms of ideology, but being you know top to bottom, the haves and the have nots that really what unites a rural farmer in Southern Minnesota and a uh, miner in Northern Minnesota, and maybe uh, someone in the inner city is an, a very clear economic uh, populist message. The idea that Again, the slogan famously, uh, which everyone repeats here in Minnesota, that we all do better when we all do better, uh, was really um, uh, just showing folks that no matter where you are, no matter uh, where you came from, uh, no matter um, who you love, uh, that at the end of the day, um, everyone is looking to build a better family for their life, uh, for their fa or be build a life, better life for their family, and uh, and and build a better future for their community. And that means that you know, again, when we really think about this, this is not a question of ideology in some ways. And when we talk about how we reach out to Republican leaning voters or uh, uh, you know uh, the white working class, some of which have abandoned us over the years. Years now, we really need to make sure that we uh, recognize that we have a lot more in common than we even imagine. And that's something that Paul understood that you could go and talk to Republican leaning voters, right? And farmers who maybe uh, the Democratic Party has written off and you can find common ground because a lot of their hopes and aspirations uh, are based and born out of the same struggles that many people throughout this state and country are facing on a daily basis. And when we start to tear down labels and barriers, we can start to find again where those common hopes and aspirations are. And again, uh, make sure that we're connecting to people and their hopes for the future. Uh, and when we, again, put on this lens of partisanship, we just don't see past that. And oftentimes we, we, we target too narrowly, I believe, as a party. Uh, we aren't communicating our values because we're only narrowly focused on a certain uh, segment of the population. Uh, and we have to get back. Again, I think Anat is exactly right. What really unites people across ideological spectrum, across uh, demographic spectrums, across, across geography is uh, this race class narrative. And, um, you know, if, if you don't know about it, Anat Shanker Osario is, is really one of the leading thinkers of our time. And she's done a, amazing work. And a lot of this feeds into what George is talking about is how, how do we frame that message in a way that connects with independent voters and even Republican leaning voters? Well, we have to again get into the space where we acknowledge that we all have a lot more uh, in common than we might even imagine. And 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 that uh, prefix that that she's putting on there, you know, I think uh, also goes back. You that is a values message that is beyond a specific issue, and the idea of basically making a sandwich out of your message that you've got these long-term strategic frames opening and closing what you're doing, and then you're sandwiching in the middle your, your uh, very specific frame of what's happening now. And the more we can do that, I think the better. We, and also my experience has been that it's a lot easier to do 
people worry about knowing every last tiny thing about every issue and they're afraid they're going to be asked a question they can't answer and uh, the voters thinking the same thing people are all thinking my gosh you know we're going to start a conversation and we're both idiots uh, but when you're talking about values you know you have this you have a common ground that's something everybody can talk about right and wrong so that's right uh, there's there's that um you mentioned also that uh, that between Republicans and Democrats and urban and rural and other places, there's a lot in common. We, we also have some, uh, you know, we're not, I don't think we're as fractured as the Republican Party, but we have some split there. And I uh, heard you talking in a podcast about how, uh, well, I'll, maybe I'll just ask it as a question. How do we as a party make sure that we come together before an election and do what needs to happen to get Democrats elected or the alternative is a Republican? How do you know what anything specific on that? You want to... Yeah, look, I mean, I would just say that our party has never evolved on critical issues without people on the inside uh, pushing hard to uh, move it to the left. And uh, I, 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 I think that's really important. You know, and I I started with Paul. We were all young, radical organizers who wanted to burn, burn the party down. Right. And and burn the building down. And what what uh, Paul said is, you know, you can affect change from the outside, but true, meaningful, lasting change doesn't happen unless it comes from the inside. And so get involved in the party, make it uh, in, in the image that you want. Uh, but uh, if you really want that lasting change, it has to come from the inside. And when you think about this, George, think back to 1948 to the convention in Philadelphia when Hubert Humphrey introduced a civil rights plank at the platform committee. Many people don't know the history of that, but the platform committee voted it down. Humphrey took his minority report to the floor of that convention. He built up enough support for that, and it passed. And with that, of course, the Dixiecrats got up, left the hall as uh, Hubert Humphrey gave his famous speech where he said it's time for the Democratic Party to come out of the shadows of state rights and march forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights and civil rights. It changed our party for the better. And, you know, think about many issues over the years that wouldn't have come without people from within the party pushing hard. That's true in the early uh, late 60s, early 70s, as it came to equal rights and to uh, and to uh, reproductive rights. It certainly came in 2012 uh, when I was proud to author uh, one of the platform planks to make sure that our party finally recognized uh, marriage equality in our party platform. It doesn't help it happen without people pushing. And why do, do, do I say that? Because at the end of the day, we have to be a big tent. And a big tent means we welcome everyone who wants to be a Democrat into our party, no matter where they're at on this journey no matter where they're at on this journey. That includes the far left. People might refer to them as themselves as socialists. It includes progressive liberals like myself. It includes centrists. It includes conservative Democrats. It includes anyone who wants to be a part of this party who generally agrees with our principle, who wants to roll up their sleeves and actually help build a party. I think that's really critical. But what it shouldn't include is people who are um, willing to burn everything down to prove a point. I had some activists say recently, when is the DFL party going to realize that it's okay to lose an election to prove a point? And my answer is never, because elections have consequences. In 2016, and this isn't the only reason why we're in this position we are now, but we are literally two months away from seeing uh, Roe v. Wade overturn. When I, and I'll share a quick story with you. When I was a freshman in college, I was a patient escort at Dr. Tiller's clinic down in Wichita, Kansas escorting women into uh, his abortion clinic there. Now, many of you know, in 2008, Dr. Tiller was uh, assassinated in his church, handing out communion, shot in the head by an individual named Scott Rader, who believed that his actions were justified because he was saving the lives of millions of unborn children. I share that story because for me, that issue of reproductive rights is very personal. It's something I've organized around my whole life. And when we let perfect be the enemy of good, and we decide not to vote in an election or we decide to vote for a third party candidate, we are in fact, we are in fact surrendering. And in a way, we are putting at risk every issue that we care about. I, I know this is controversial maybe to say, but it, this is really not about candidates. It's not about our office holders, our elected officials, they think it is. But for us, it's really about the issues we're fighting for. 
And I think if there's any silver lining in this moment we're in right now, George, is that I think people are starting to wake up in this country and realize that there are no rights that are guaranteed. There are no rights that are enshrined, even the right to vote, which is under a tremendous assault right now around this country like we've never seen. And in fact, if you look at what's happening in state legislative bodies and even in Congress and the Supreme Court decisions recently, we are, we are steadily going back to Jim Crow laws and it won't be long before we go even further back. And so it's important for folks to realize, everyone on this call realizes, but it's important for us to realize that no right is guaranteed. Every generation has to fight this fight anew. And I say that because for me, I want people involved in this party I want people to push this party to be better. But when it's a choice between a Democrat and a Republican, if you choose to sit that out because you don't agree with the Democratic candidate 100% of the time, you are in fact potentially contributing to us taking steps backwards on critical issues and critical rights that we have fought and, and many people have died for in this country. And so look, I really believe that we need a big tent party, George, but we need to do it in a way that actually helps evolve our party and push our party and grow our party, not uh, in a way that divides our party and uh, allows us to devolve into what we've seen on the Republican side right now. Uh, and that's not good. It's just not good. So I know that's not what you uh, wanted, but I will say that it's important. I, I believe that we always lead with a big tent. There's plenty of space in this party for, uh, for dissent and for, for um, debate. There's plenty of debate uh, that we've had in this party and will continue to have. That is healthy. But when that debate turns to inaction or that debate turns into us not uh, voting for our Democratic candidates, then, then we are, in fact, uh, complicit in, in those elections. Last thing I'll say, and, and just to share a story, 1996, my hero, uh, who I loved dearly, was Paul Wellstone, and he voted for the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, my origin story into politics had to do with my grandfather, who was gay and who passed away in the in 1990. The reality is, is that uh, when when Paul voted for DOMA, uh, he was voting against my family, and it was very personal to me. And I didn't talk to him for some time. It also helped me as a young organizer understand at that seminal moment in my life that um, I don't have to agree with someone 100% of the time in this party, right? Who am I to say what makes a Democrat? There's lots of different stripes of Democrats. And I still, to this day, believe that. Um, I don't agree with anyone 100% of the time, including myself most of the time. So my point being is, is that at the end of the day, we got to fight for our values and we got to continue to push our party to be uh, uh, better on a whole host of issues. And um, I hope that I led the party that way and I'll continue to lead the party that way as long as I'm involved. I think one of the most important things you you said there really has to do with, uh, with the coalition. I mean, you look at the DFL itself, it is in effect a, a, a conglomeration of people with different, you had labor, you had farmers, you had um, uh, you know, all sorts of other kinds of Democrats we see. We are a big tent. And uh, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing I think needs to be said. And, uh, and that we all, when, when push comes to shove, we all have to come together because if we don't get Democrats elected, we have nothing. And I think we all saw here in the last four years anyway, that things that every one of us thought were rock solid, like, like a building, like the Capitol, are vulnerable, uh, not just the building, but our ideas, but those things that we all, uh, that we all have trust in. You know, it's kind of like the buck. One dollar, it's printed on a piece of paper. It's worthless. But it's not worthless because we all believe it is worth something. And so our values are worth something. Our values, no matter what stripe of Democrat you are, are the same core values. Yep. And so and that we can agree on. That's right. But let, let me say, you know, Hubert Humphrey was not being altruistic when he formed the DFL party in 1944. Uh, many historians remember that Humphrey, the young mayor of Minneapolis, was getting ready to run statewide for the U.S. Senate. And so he realized that the Democratic Party on its own could not cobble enough votes together to win a statewide race at the time. And so it was really born out of necessity, a necessity to build power, not just for Humphrey, but a power around the things we care about. And so when you take that story and you reverse engineer it, if we start to fracture uh, too much into our own little camps, we are in fact putting in jeopardy the ability to build power around the issues we care about. 
You know, every year someone would come to me and say, uh, you know, you need to run um, Colin Peterson out of the party because he's pro-life, he's pro-gun, he's anti-gay uh, marriage, and uh, he doesn't represent our values. And I said, well, you know, he represents someone's values and he wins in the seventh district. And what's important is the most important thing he'd say to me, and, and I agreed with him on, I didn't agree with him on much, was that the most important vote he cast was the first vote, that first vote for Speaker of the House. And he always voted for Nancy Pelosi. He always voted for a Democrat. Sometimes, again, for us to build power around issues that we care about, right, we need candidates who fit their district. We need candidates that sometimes aren't 100% aligned with us on every issue, but are going to vote with us to help us build power around the issues that we care about. And I think that's part of being strategic. That's part of being uh, understanding that we're not going to run, be able to run the most progressive candidate in Western Minnesota, and we may not be able to run the most conservative candidate in Minneapolis. But together, when we win, we can actually start to move the needle in a progressive way around the issues and agenda that we care about. Yeah, we have a, and when we do, we end up with a good solid democratic community that gets things done. That's right. Uh, which uh, kind of brings me around. I, you know, one, one thing. Thanks to you know, the the work that that we've been able to do with your help, getting around Minnesota. Minnesota is you know, we have our uh, urban areas, but we also have a large uh, rural area. And getting around the state has been has been really an eye opener for me over the last four or five years. And uh, and is there? And maybe this is a little off of messaging, but. What kinds of things can we do in the urban areas to connect with and help out uh, the, our, our, our fellow activists in the rural parts of Minnesota and in other parts of the country? I mean, I don't know how much we can do, but any ideas would be great because I think it's something we do have to pay attention to. Well, we aren't going to win unless we do. Yeah. Well, first off, I think the work that you're doing through Connections Lab is really important because oftentimes uh, when we train candidates, we don't spend enough time on um, really how to deliver an effective message. It's really around messaging, meaning we'll provide talking points around key issues. Uh, and, and sometimes not even that, to be honest, honest with you, George, I believe that we could be doing a better job to train candidates to, so that they are effective messengers. And part of that is making sure that they understand framing and particularly in greater Minnesota, not using words that are going to trigger uh, the wrong frame and put us in a place where we're never going to win over the hearts and minds of voters because we are using the wrong word choice. We're using the wrong frames. We're debating on the Republican ground. And so when we talk about framing, right, it's not, people don't realize this. You and I talked about this in the very early days when, when you first came to me on this. It's not just about issues and, and issue research. We can take any issue and make it more effective for us if we know the right way to frame it so that we are debating on our ground and not on their ground. And, you know, I, I think that's one. Two, as you know, one of my Framing and messaging heroes is Drew Weston, who is uh, wrote a book called The Political Brain. The Brain, and it's a really important book, and it was really seminal for those of you who haven't read it. I really encourage you to. It's 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 not as much about framing as it is about why Democrat uh, Democratic candidates, elected officials, and party leaders like myself and activists like you all are oftentimes bad messengers. And what he said in that, and I know many of you read this book already, so I, I'm sorry for repeating it, but he studied the 2008 elections. And in that election, he studied uh, many people, uh, including Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman and others who ran President Obama, et cetera. He said, the reason Democrats are such bad messengers is because we use a lot of stats and facts and reason. And while we're, it's okay to be right on the issues, Oftentimes when we're using stats and facts and reason, we are trying to educate the voters. And when you're trying to educate the voters, you're tr you, you believe you're right and you're talking all the time and you're not listening. You're not open your ears. You're not having a conversation with the voter. That's one. Two, when you lose using stats and facts and reason, sometimes those stats fly right over someone's head because they're not connecting with people on an individual basis. Right. So when we talk about, you know, the fact that we just passed a one point two trillion dollar infrastructure bill, what does that really mean to someone in Marshall, Minnesota? 
What does that mean to someone in Egan, Minnesota, right? We have to actually do what he said the Republicans do well, which is if you listen to Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin, completely vacuous, there's no substance to anything they say, right? However, what they very cleverly do is use a lot of emotive words and offer values propositions to the voters. So while they're trying to connect to the heart, Democrats are trying to connect to the brain. We actually have to do both. We have to connect to the brain and to the heart at the same time. We need to use more emotive language. We need to use more values propositions. We need to tell more stories, right, to illustrate that. And then we need to localize it. We need to give real world examples in their community that help make all of these abstract uh, um, concepts seem real in their lives. And when we start to do that, we, we become more effective messengers. And to your point, George, how can you help and everyone on this call? I don't care what state you're in, but mm -hmm. helping candidates and our standard bearers, people that are carrying these messages to the voters, understand how to connect with voters through this framing lens and, and by being more effective messengers is some of the most important work we can do right now. And I'm not saying it just because I'm on here. I say it everywhere that we go. The reality is, is we need to be more effective messengers. And it's not because we don't have the facts on our side or that we're not right on the issues or that we have a set of values that we care about. We do deeply, but if you listen to Democrats, we very rarely lead with our values. We oftentimes lead with all the stats and the facts and, and that's great, but let's start telling more stories. Let's start making it more personal. Let's tell folks your why. Everyone on this call has their own why. George and I have talked about this. We each have different whys, but they're rooted. In, and when you strip everything away, they're rooted in who we are as a democratic party. Every one of you, when you go out and talk to a voter, throw that damn script away, throw those talking points away, and you speak from the heart. Tell people why you're taking a Sunday out of your, or a Saturday out of your, your week to go and knock on doors and talk to voters. That in, a, in itself is going to go a lot further than you just reciting a bunch of talking points, right? And I tell candidates that all the time. Don't waste time developing all these white papers and policy positions. You can do that later, right? The reality is most voters want to know what's in your heart, right? What, what, why you decided to run for office, right? Why you're making these sacrifices for people. And then you can pivot to what you would do if elected. That's the biggest thing you can do to help, George, and you're doing it. So thank you. Thank you for that. That's that's nice. Um, you know, one thing I'd add is if you do that and you go to the door, you may not know what effect you had. You, oftentimes we go to the door. We don't really know whether we got that voter or not. But the thing is, is you never really know for sure. But if you give somebody another way to look at something uh, and, and it aligns with some values that they have and they see the benefit in it, they uh, you know, even even right-wingers, uh, about a third of the time when I do that, I find that, they, that I, what I hear back is, you know, I never thought about it that way. They, and they honestly haven't because the rights messaging machine is so lockstep and been feeding the same messages for 40, 50 years now. That's all they've ever heard. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, they're like a dog and they <laughs> turn their head sideways and their ears perk around and they go, I never thought of it that way. Hey, that's a seed that you planted. That's strategic messaging. And if we're all doing that and we all show up at the door and what they see is someone who believes in what they're doing, who's willing to offer the reasons why they're a Democrat and the reasons uh, or and, and the reasons why what we do are good for people and that the voter can see that, then all of a sudden we've started to change minds. And, and if, if you didn't get that person this time, you may get them 10 years from now. Think of what would happen if we were doing this 40 years ago. And 20 years ago and 30 years ago, whatever, you know, we would have, you know, things would be a lot easier. We'd have that foundation, that, that runway for our candidates when they come in to talk to people and they open the door. And now they're, the, these ideas are not alien anymore. And it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, um, George? You know, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, did you want more questions? There is uh, one question in the chat right now, unless you've got something else you're um, segueing to. We, we can think that there's there, there's just one other thing I wanted to talk about, and then I think maybe we'll open up for questions. Lisa, would you keep track of that question so we get to that first? Yep, yep. Um, definitely. Uh, I want to go back to what you were talking about first, and uh, about being able to 
to, to dole out a punch when we need to. And uh, this is something we had a webinar on uh, a month ago, and it, it, it's a difficult thing for people to do. It's a difficult thing to think about because we're, we're normally, like I say, we're normally well, more, more likely to come out with facts and statistics and reasoning. But we also sometimes think that if we are, you know, saying truthful things about, the, about today's Republican Party, we're going to sound as if we're negative or whatever other reasons people have for reticence. But you're pretty bold about it, which I think is great. You know, these folks are, are fascists. This is where they're coming from. The reason they harp on socialists all the time is, as a lot of their messages are, their distractions and projections of what they're doing. So, like, they're talking about voter fraud as a cover. So, you know, they're saying the Democrats are the problem when they're having massive campaigns of voter suppression. And so um, how, how do we talk about the GOP? What guidance can you give well, on that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think what this comes down to is that the Republicans uh, have understood uh, very clearly for some time now, dating back to the early 80s, maybe even before that, that the, one of the greatest motivators, unfortunately, in terms of an emotion is fear. And they use fear to uh, essentially move the electorate as a persuasion tool. Uh, and we, as a, as a counter, like to use hope, right? And again, we want to talk about the future and give people a sense that uh, the better days are ahead, right? And so when we frame our message, even when we are trying to take on the Republicans, we do it through the lens of, of trying to give people uh, a sense of, of brighter days ahead. Sometimes we need to put that BS, and it's not BS, but we need to put it aside and we need to just punch the Republicans in the nose and call them out for, the, for their lies and the misinformation that they're spreading and, and, and flip, use fear. We should start using fear, right? I mean, what we just saw on January 6th, for instance, which was, unprecedented in my lifetime, a coup attempt in this country, an attempt to overthrow uh, Congress, uh, to decertify a rightful election, uh, to uh, it, it basically storm the Capitol, five people died. We've never seen anything like it in my history. The reality is this was incited by a, re a Republican president. It was cheered on by Republicans throughout the nation, and they own it. Now they're trying to whitewash their history. They're trying to create a different narrative, and we should not let them off the hook for one of the worst attacks on our democracy ever. So when we talk about freedom-loving Americans, you can't say you're a Republican and you love freedom when you're storming the Capitol and trying to overthrow our Constitution. So again, we need to punch them in the nose and we can't be afraid to do that, George. Oftentimes Democrats, we think that we don't, we shouldn't get a, uh, you know, in the mud with the Republicans and, 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 and wrestle around that old saying that you shouldn't you know, get around and do that. Well, for me, that's our problem. We believe we're better than that. And oftentimes we come across as elitist because we're not willing to throw a punch and call out their BS. There's no compunction on their part they spread lies and misinformation about our candidates and party all the time. They've got a whole news channel dedicated to that. So my point being is, is that we don't have to become like the Republicans, but we have to be more aggressive in putting them on the defense. We cannot allow them to always put us on the defense. Part of that goes to framing, yeah. right? Part of that goes to messaging. If we're always debating within their frame, they win. So let's change it. Let's flip the script. Let's put them in our frame. Let's put them on the defense. Let's punch them in the nose and define them for a change. You see, that's why this is so important. We cannot allow them to keep defining us. Us believe we're better than that. We're going to take a highbrow, educated response to this and look like we're civil. Well, guess what? People aren't buying that. It makes us look weak. We're not weak. We're standing up for the majority of Americans while they're standing up for the few. We got to punch them in the nose. And I don't mean to keep <laughs> talking about punching, but you get what I'm saying here, right? It is, it is a, 
we have we have to be more aggressive. And I'm, I get so frustrated at our Democratic Party nationally. And in the states, there are candidates and elected officials who drive me crazy because they're not willing to fight for what we care about. And we're doing voters a disservice if we're not talking about these things. You know, if we're not talking about them, people may believe that we don't think it's important or that we don't care about that. And, and we have to do it. I think it's really important. Um, uh, you know, and, and like you say, framing, we also have to talk about, uh, for example, we hear the media talk about, for example, Joe Biden's failure to pass voting rights. And, you know, we need to turn that around. Every time you hear that, we say, how is it a failure when we all voted for it? This is the failure of the Republicans to pass voting rights. They didn't do it. They didn't assure your right to vote and, and calling them out uh, and, uh, and doing it. Uh, I, th I think, uh, um, again, uh, you hear the uh, name the villain part of this. And I think it's important to do that so people know what the story really is. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say? Or, and then we'll go to questions again. No, just um, listen to what George and Lisa are talking about, because, you know, it seems highly technical in terms of framing and how to do this. And there is a lot of technical pieces to it, but word choice matters, frames matter. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this earlier and you guys have all heard about this really famous study that was done in 1984. And it was uh, before people went in for elective surgery, they asked them this question with two different frames. They said, are you still interested in moving forward with this surgery knowing that 94% of people will survive this procedure? They then ask the same question. Are you still interested in moving forward with this surgery, knowing that six out of 100 people die from this procedure? Same question, different mm -hmm. frame. So even though it is the same statistic, the study revealed that people tend to agree to the surgery when they're presented with the survival rates versus the death rates. People are making different choices based on how the outcome is framed. You see that? That's why framing matters. We are debating in the Republican frame. And when we're debating on that ground, we're never going to win. So we got to flip the script, put them on our frame and start putting them on the defense. That actually is in this book also, Thinking Fast yes. and Slow, which is a, another great book. This and Drew West and I keep these, the, and Lake Off stuff, I keep right next to each other, along with my other favorite book, just a quick, a quick shout out to uh, Harvest yes. the Vote by Jen Klab, who is absolutely amazing. Whether you are in the rural area or not, everyone should read this book. And it's That's really exactly great, right. great way to talk about how we do things. She's got, she's a natural framer like Ken is. Um, well, let me, let me just illustrate one thing that my friend Jane uh, highlights in that book. As many of you know, Jane was the, uh, one of the lead organizers against the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, and she recounts showing up at a rally uh, in Western Nebraska. And there were all these pickup trucks there, many of them with gun racks and guns in the back, and then a bunch of George Bush uh, uh, bumper stickers, right? And she said, oh my God, what the hell have I got myself into? She goes into this rally. And what she realized is that many of those people in there, uh, most of them ranchers, most of them Republicans were just as upset and frustrated about that Keystone pipeline as she was because of the eminent domain and the fact that the government was taking their land. So this goes back to what I said before, which is if we make assumptions about voters or people just because of the bumper sticker they, they have or how they voted in one previous election, we are not listening to and them, and we're not finding common ground around issues that we care about. And I think for her, that was a seminal moment in her organizing career to realize that there, you can build unlikely alliances if you're willing to listen and find that common ground. It goes back to what I said about Paul Wellstone, understanding that there is more that unites these disparate groups around the state than divides them. And that is an, a really important part of messaging, because if you can start, look, I'm not interested in, in joining forces with a bunch of racists and, and white supremacists and fascists. Don't get me wrong, right? There are certain people that we don't want to work with. That's just the way it is. 
But there is a whole group of people in this country that we probably have more in common with, but because we've already ascribed some sort of label to them, we refuse to engage them in this conversation. We have to do better. That includes people on the left, Again, as I said, I don't care if you're a socialist. If you want to be in this party, we want you in this party. Uh, and that includes people on the far, I wouldn't say far right, but the right and the middle. We want everyone in this party because more people have more in common than we even begin to imagine. Yep, and, and just to put a point on, a finer point on that, remember during the, uh, when, when, when Bernie Sanders was running and I saw news reports of people on farms and they asked them who they were supporting. And people were going, well, you know, of course, uh, I think, you know, uh, Donald Trump is great and all that. But, you know, I kind of like that Bernie, too. And like, in what universe is that possible? Well, the universe that's possible in is a much more populist message. It's, it's the things that, that people have been for for a long time and that we're getting back to. In fact, one of the dangers I see is the, the right right now is having a bit more of a populist message. And I think we need to be out there with that. When we go and we talk to people, we say, you know, when your rural clinics are closing, Democrats are for keeping that from happening. When you, right. you don't have the good job there and you're working for yourself, so you can't get the health insurance, we're for making that work. You know, we're for getting your kids back so they can get a college education without going into complete debt, you know, those kind of things. So I won't right. put any more of a point on it than that. But uh, um, uh, and, you know, a lot of what we talked about, um, we'll be talking about here in the coming months. And we we do a shift just so everybody knows we do a shift starting about now where we're going to be going more towards very practical things you can use in your organizations and in your party units and your campaigns. And we did this back the last election cycle. And this may include also some videos that we'll do that you can bring into your organization so that we can get people thinking along the lines of talk about why you care about things. And that'll apply in letter to the editor training. It'll apply to phone banking and door knocking stuff that we do. So we're, we're trying to move that framing in practical things and things that you can use. So keep that in mind. Um, otherwise, uh, Lisa, what was that okay, first yep. question? Okay, yeah, I've got a few questions here. I'm going to start them in order from when they were entered into the chat. So uh, this first one here, um, it's uh, from Greg and he would like to hear uh, Ken's thoughts about um, messaging lessons from Biden's State of the Union address. Well, first off, I thought it was a great speech. Um, uh, and, and not just from the substance of it, but just the clarity of making sure people understood where he stood, where our party stood on a number of critical issues, right? And, um, you know, we can all agree that Biden probably isn't the smoothest speaker. Uh, let's be honest, uh, there were some moments there that uh, we all probably cringed at, but the reality is, is when you strip those moments away and you listen to the words and you listen to what he was putting out there, it was pretty amazing. And again, the clarity in which he spoke. And then, you know, look, I, I think there's a, a few things when we think about messaging. The first, as I said, facts do not convince people, stories do. And in Biden's address, uh, so much of what he talked about was through the lens of, of stories of real people, of communities throughout this country who've been suffering under this pandemic. So that's one. Two, the best frames for any message have the following structure. One is a vision, two is an obstacle, and three is an action. And when I think about that, Biden presented all of those. He presented a vision for where we're moving this country. He talked about the obstacles that stand in the way, and he gave a very specific action, not just to Congress, but to the American people about how we need to come together to move this country forward. That is a structure of the best message you can put together. You need to have a vision, an obstacle, and an action. And so, you know, when I think about the State of the Union address, I, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, I, I, I thought he did exactly what he needed to do. But let me give you an example on this because I think one of the worst blunders we've made as a Democratic Party is around uh, the, the slogan, defund the police. And the Democratic Party didn't make that at all, right? 
Uh, there's very few people, there might be some on this call, but there's very few people I know who actually want to defund the police. Most people actually, like me, want uh, uh, to see um, systemic reform because we know that there's systemic and institutionalized racism in policing and in police forces throughout this country, right? But when we talk about defund the police, we're ignoring the reality when we see an increase in crime that people don't want fewer police on the streets. They want more police on the streets to make sure that crime is brought down. And so I think about someone that who has really effectively framed that issue as Mayor Melvin Carter in St. Paul. One of the things he said, his dad was a St. Paul police. He said, I don't want to take police away. It's the last thing I want to do, but I do want us to reimagine public safety. I want us to reimagine what uh, policing should look like. And he says, look, if I'm having a, a heart attack and I go into a hospital and the hospital is all filled with brain surgeons, how does that help me? Right? We need to diversify our police force, not just in terms of demographic diversity, but in terms of skill sets so that we're meeting the needs of the community where the community is at. Now, when he says that, of course, no one disagrees with him, right? Because he's not saying we're taking police away. What he's saying is we're reimagining what a police force in this modern day and age looks like. That's a different frame with the same outcome, right? It's changing how we do police policing and not so and so that's again where word choice and frames matter and i thought when the president said very clearly look we're not for defunding the police we're for funding the police because we are that doesn't mean we're for funding bad police that doesn't mean we're for funding uh just warrior style trained police it means we're for funding police so that we can actually do public safety the right way in our communities that was brilliant on the president's part in my mind. Lisa, is there another question? Uh, yes, um, the question is, is it smart to talk about Trump in, the, uh, in this election cycle? Boy, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Who had that question? Um, <laughs> let me say this, I think it's a mixture of both, right? It's, it's a not, it, you shouldn't live just in that space. Candidates who just live in that space are going to die in that space. And I, 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 don't, I don't mean that uh, literally, but it's not, it's not enough uh, to uh, propel you to victory and certainly not enough. We're not running against Donald Trump. Uh, uh, at the same time, I do think he still continues to have a pretty uh, firm grip on the Republican Party. And he continues to still engage in some pretty um, uh, disgusting behavior. And so for me, the reality is, is I think we need to call out these last four years. We also need to call out his continued actions uh, and we need to be forceful about that. And then we need to pivot to what we as Democrats are doing right now because we're in control, right? <laughs> uh, the reality is, is it, 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 you, you can't um, talk about changing Washington and changing <laughs> this country uh, without acknowledging that we have control. And so that means we have to talk about what we're doing for people while we have power, what we're doing to deliver on the promises we made. And so if we're just, if we just think we're going to win by attacking Donald Trump and the Republicans, um, it's not a winning message for us at this time. We have to do both. I think we can call out the Republicans and their shameful behavior. Uh, I think we can continue to link it to Donald Trump and the uh, fact that the far right has uh, a firm grip on their party. But I also think we have to talk about what we're doing to, to make a difference in people's lives. I could be wrong on that. I've seen lots of different, I'll tell you what, seen lots of different polling on this <laughs> and it's sort of all over the map uh, uh, to be honest with you. There's polls that I've seen that really say right now uh, a, a full-on assault on Trump uh, is the right path to go and another that uh, suggests exactly the opposite. So I sort of come down the middle on that. We got to do both. Okay uh, next question. How can you specifically use your own core values to relate to an audience whose values and agendas are different than your own? You know, again, I think um, in, it, it depends on what issues we're talking about at the time, right? Um, but I, I often uh, think that, um, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, and, and George talked about this, uh, you know, 
when I think about someone in, let's say, a, a farmer in southern Minnesota who's concerned about, um, uh, you know, their community uh, or concerned about health care and having to drive 100 miles to find uh, uh, their closest clinic and their clinic in their town has uh, closed up, right? Uh, a lot of those concerns are reflected in uh, communities in the metro area and in the suburbs uh, around healthcare access and and affordability. And so, you know, um, you know, I think let's take the issue of abortion for a moment, right? Um, I think that's an issue where, particularly in Greater Minnesota, a lot of people want to start the conversation there, right? But you know, the reality is is we can disagree on the issue of, of abortion and talk about how we're going to actually support families and children and get people onto that conversation. And when you do, um, and I found that, um, you know, just acknowledging at the front end, you're not going to find agreement there. But what we can agree on is making sure that when children are brought into this world, that they're supported, uh, that we are making sure they're set up for success, that they have um, the uh, tools uh, to succeed in life. Um, and to me, I found that to be better than trying to convince people on issues that you're not going to convince them on. You, again, you can find some agreement somewhere on some of these uh, issues where, again, they're tricky and, and controversial, and you're not necessarily going to win them over. Part of that is framing. Part of, them is, part of that is realizing you're sometimes not going to win the argument with people, but you can still find some common ground around issues that uh, you all agree on. Okay, next. Um, what is the DFL doing to recruit candidates for a school board? We know a lot of QAnon moms are running this year, and I'm very scared about the repercussions. What can we do to help? Yeah, thank you for that. And I saw that was from Brianna. Thank you for being on, by the way, Brianna. Um, I will say that um, we're, we're very actively involved in this right now. In fact, uh, we're working with a group called Contest Every Race. Uh, and the idea is that... Um, we know that when we, well, well, first, let me say this. You are absolutely spot on. The Republicans for years, actually, and this is not a, a recent phenomenon, for the last 30 to 40 years, the Republicans have been recruiting candidates at um, uh, all levels of government and particularly at local levels of government. And it's increased in its veracity over the last several years, particularly school boards, city councils, county commissions, et cetera. And, um, and our party uh, writ large, the national party and others have been really focused on Congress and governor, state legislative races and, and, and to our own peril. And we're seeing the uh, result of that here. There's a couple of reasons why we need to be doing this. One, Obviously, we need to uh, uh, recruit candidates at that local level, allow uh, through the lens of candidate uh, leadership and development and hopefully developing a future crop of candidates. But that's a very self-interested reason. The real reason why, excuse me, why we need to, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing something on the chat here. The real reason why we need to be recruiting candidates for those positions is because we are actually getting our butts kicked in these public policy arenas, in these what are typically nonpartisan offices, they're running candidates for these positions, getting them elected, and then pushing a very far right dogmatic agenda. And we absolutely cannot afford to keep losing at that level. And we've seen the unfortunate consequence in school boards throughout the nation over the last year here. Uh, and uh, we have got a reverse course. So we're working with Contest Every Race, which is an organization that's focused in on recruiting candidates in all those lo uh, lower level races throughout the country and particularly here in Minnesota. Oftentimes it's hard to find candidates. And so they're helping us on candidate recruitment and then candidate support and helping with their campaigns uh, so that they're prepared to win. And then when they win to govern. And so I, 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 it's not going to happen overnight, Brianna, but it's something that I've been committed to. We've changed our party rules, as many of you know, to allow uh, candidates to get letters of support. That's something I pushed when I first came in as chair so that candidates running for local office could now get access to the van and other tools to actually um, allow them to succeed in their office. 
uh, or their, their race. So we're changing our rules. We're working with organizations that are committed to recruiting candidates. There's a lot more we could do. Uh, and certainly if any of you have ideas, let me know. But we've got to just shift our lens a little bit just from thinking about the state legislative and above races and really the importance of these down ballot races. Uh, they're so important. They're pushing this agenda and we're not in those spaces competing as much as we should be. And then look at the candidates that we we have once they've been on school board or they've been on city council, uh, been on commissions locally. And now we, we've been able to take their measure. We've seen who they are. We've put people there and they move up and they, they and those are the, those are the candidates of the future. So this very important, uh, spending, spending as much, it's very easy as Ken says to, to go to a local office uh, DFL office and all of a sudden there's campaign signs for legislative candidates and and senators and how US House and president. You can't forget about the local races. You have to have to get people. And you're all activists on this call. I've everybody that 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 has been coming to these are people who are are doing this work every day. Uh, be out there looking for those folks and talk to folks and have them see what it takes. Do some candidate training about what it takes to even think about being a candidate and that helps too uh one thing you mentioned ken this um this contest every race group uh is this something that a local unit should be contacting the dfl about or they're, will the group they're, contact they're, them? they've already contacted our local units george okay. um, i will tell you there's <laughs> Not all of our leaders in the party are very supportive of this idea because there's still a notion that these should be nonpartisan races. Oh, in please. fact, when I changed the policy uh, 11 years ago as chair, one of the reforms I pushed was to open up the letters of support to local candidates. We got a lot of grief from people <laughs> because they said these are nonpartisan races and we shouldn't politicize them. And I said, are you kidding me? They're already politicized. Uh, for Christ's sake, we got to actually start competing here. And uh, we have more and more, but there's, to Brianna's point, there's still so much more we could be doing there. Um, but part of the challenge is the culture within our party, again, because we think we're better than the Republicans. We're not going to politicize these offices. Well, they're politicizing them, and whether we like it or not, we can either start uh, getting engaged in that uh, debate at that local level, or just let the Republicans uh, have an unfettered um, lane in all these local governments. Uh, I refuse to do the latter, but I need a little bit more help and convincing our unit leaders that this is the right approach. You would think when the QAnon shaman shows up at your school board meeting, it's time to start taking this partisan stuff seriously. That's <laughs> right. Know, and get out there and unabashedly be Democrats. We have to be proud to be Democrats. We have to, yeah. we have to tell people we, we aren't afraid to be Democrats. We're, we're perfectly behind all these candidates. Another question. Yep. Is there a is there a DFL candidate running against uh, Stauber in the eighth? And if not, why not? There is a candidate up there right now named uh, Joseph uh, uh, Peltier um, uh, Odegaard. He's a uh, uh, Native American uh, from uh, Bemidji uh, and uh, a really nice young activist. I don't know. I, I do know there will be other candidates that are there are other candidates that we've had conversations with. Um, Look, this is a, the eighth district actually of our eight congressional districts. Um, uh, seven of the eight actually got slightly more democratic in the redistricting. And I will tell you that um, uh, the eighth district is still on paper a swing district. The two swing districts are CD1 and CD8. Uh, we feel with the right candidate up there, uh, we could win that uh, race. Um, uh, and I know that there's a number of folks who are looking at that right now. And so, um, mm. It's, it, I know it's late, it might seem late in the cycle to some. Um, uh, the reality is, is that a lot of these congressional races around the country, really because of the lateness of redistricting uh, here in this state, we're just gonna have truncated congressional races. Um, uh, uh, we will have a strong candidate up there. We will uh, compete in the 8th District. Some of our top targets are up in Northern Minnesota. Uh, uh, Senate District 3 and Senate District 7 are really ground zero in our um, ability uh, and our desire to win back the state Senate and to hold the House majority. Uh, we also, as uh, I just saw in the chat, that's exactly right. One of the things that we are, our plaintiffs 
that the DFL put forward to the courts, pushed really hard for it, is uniting all of the Ojibwe tribes. And for the first time ever, all, Oj all of the um, Ojibwe tribes, which are the Northern Minnesota tribes, are united in one congressional district. Uh, I believe those tribal nations were severely undercounted in the census. Uh, there's a lot more votes on those tribal lands than, uh, than were counted. And if we, turn, if we can turn those votes out with the right candidate, we have a really good shot at winning there. So, you know, I, it's still a work in progress, trust me on this, but um, uh, I do think we'll have a good candidate emerge uh, soon. And Joseph is a really good guy, don't get me wrong. He's a, he's a great guy. Can you get a contact for us? It would be nice to get in touch with the tribal uh, 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 councils and the, uh, the Ojibwe's if they're organized on that. Be happy to lend a hand if we can. Yeah, absolutely. We'll just remind me on that, George. I'm happy to send that over to you. Okay, another question. Uh, why do our people not use the proper adjectives before abortion? Why don't we pivot to a woman's right to life? You know, it's interesting. There's a lot of ways to talk about this, right? Um, and I think when we talk, uh, we, we often use the the frame, the wrong frame again, when we say pro-life, right? We are, um, we're, we're, we're the, the word choices and the adjectives we're using are not, uh, to your point, correct. And so we, uh, we, it's a better frame, I think, to say that they're anti-choice, right? And um, but there's also uh, other frames out there that you could potentially use to reinforce the point. But we need to stop referring to people who are pro-birth uh, only <laughs> as, as uh, pro-life because they're not. Um, and so, and I like that, Greg, reproductive read. And, and Betsy's right. Everyone is pro-life, right? Uh, it, except the Republicans who are really just pro-birth and then they don't give a crap about the child once it's born. But <laughs> that's like, right. So this is where, again, when word choice matters, and when we, we start talk, referring to people as being pro-life, we are um, we're act actively triggering a certain um, uh, set of beliefs in people's minds that we, we have to, this is really important. A message frame is not just what you choose to say, but as importantly, what you choose not to say. Probably more important what you choose not to say. And so not reinforcing those trigger words that are going to uh, actually let someone off the hook. So when we say you're pro-life, who isn't pro-life? Everyone's pro-life, right? But no, the Republicans are just pro-fetus um, and they're not pro-life. Uh, but when we do that, we, we're, we're debating in their frame. So they're anti-choice, they're anti-reproductive freedoms, right? And we have to be really clear about that. And that's a perfect example of, of why framing and word choice matters. George, what other frames do you use on that issue? You know, I, I mean, I think you mentioned them, uh, uh, although I know it's Greg Layden talks about uh, reproductive freedom, that's in there too. But yeah, I mean, do not, you, you have to stay away from, and uh, have to stay out of their frame. Because frames light up, uh, as we've talked about before, if some folks are new on this, uh, but think, think of it this way. There are, there are clusters of nerves in your head, right? There are, there are nodes, and, and all these things are connected. These ideas are connected. If you say pro-life, immediately a number of other ideas are lit up in that person's brain that are related to that. Those things are also related to other things in the Republican message. So you use the word, you've now created a cascade of, of, of awareness of these frames and the repetition of those ideas in people's heads. It, the repetition only makes them stronger. That happens at the, 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 uh, the nerve level, the nerve cell level and the co communication between them. Uh, they call it heavy and uh, um, uh, action, where things that are repeated, those nerve cells physically in the brain become stronger. And the things that are not used very much, as some of us who are older know, uh, they start to disappear. <laughs> so right. uh, very important to always think about that. And that pro-life frame is not one. And even, even I know it's real tempting to say, you know, after COVID, I can't believe any Republican can continue to call themselves pro-life when they wouldn't even wear a mask. The thing is, is you are in the pro-life frame. Get out of yeah. it. Talk yeah. about reproductive freedom. That's right. And others. Do you have another question in there? Yeah. How can Democrats 
combat the problem of death threats to our Democratic candidates to the point that a candidate drops their campaign? Well, it is, I, I don't have the answer for that. Uh, I will tell you <clears throat> the, um, the vitriol and the uh, increased death threats that even myself are seeing in the, in the last few years um, as, uh, is really unprecedented. Uh, we've had to take amazing steps just at the DFL headquarters on uh, security measures. Uh, state party leaders, uh, surprisingly, who the hell would threaten a state party leader, right? <laughs> uh, we're not in office, but um, it, it's a it's a part and parcel of how polarized this country is right now. And um, it, all of our elected officials at all levels are seeing um, death threats. I mean, you know, you, uh, Brianna raised this earlier about the QAnon folks showing up to school board meetings. Uh, it is really uh, shameful here. I, I don't mean to say folks told you so, but there was a lot of conversation in the 16 debates uh, uh, in that presidential contest around uh, normalcy and civility. And if Donald Trump is elected, that this is going to change our democracy moving forward. And so I, I think that is probably true. What was once uh, really frowned upon uh, by both parties in terms of discourse and, and, and um, you know, actions now has just been embraced by the Republicans as normal fare. Uh, and no one bristles at some of the stuff that's said anymore these days. I mean, look at what Lauren Boebert and, and Marjorie Taylor Greene did at the State of the Union address when they stood up and booed and jeered the president when he talked about his son, Bo Biden. That didn't get nearly... <laughs> the admonition it should have uh, by both Republicans and others, right? And this is sort of just one small example of how this stuff has become commonplace. When Marjorie Taylor Greene goes out and says that her and her husband are going to uh, beat up uh, trans people, right? Um, you know, I mean, you can go down the list of uh, some of the more despicable things that Republican elected officials are doing right now, but you don't hear a peep from their leadership. You don't hear a peep from even, I would say, the Republicans of yesteryear because they don't want to risk the backlash from this new crop of Republicans who are so not just strident in their beliefs, but so uh, they, they don't believe there's any consequence to their action because there is none. It's exactly what Donald Trump said. He said, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and, and no one's going to come after me. And he's basically proved them right. <laughs> and he, as a result, this new generation of Republicans think there is, there, there's uh, no consequence to the words they use, the actions they take. Uh, and that to me is a very dangerous sign for our democracy. And if there was ever a, a better time to make sure that people get up off the lazy boy and get out and volunteer, this is it. Because the people in, people in Europe look at what's going on here and they go, don't you see what's happening? We've seen this before. We know That's where right. this leads. And so that I calling them out on this, as we talked about before, very important. And uh, it's stuff. Uh, do we have another question, Lisa? Um, yeah, let's see. Um, what do you say about or to Dems thinking that smart language and moral branding should mainly be aimed at rural voters? <laughs> Mainly at rural voters, I, I, I would say, I would say we got to make sure that um, uh, our messaging and branding is always smart, <laughs> uh, first off, <laughs> and strategic. Uh, but I also think we need to make sure that we are, to my point earlier, we have to localize the messaging. We have to um, make sure that it connects with voters and personalize it in a way that's compelling. And if all we're doing is using stats and facts and, uh, and, and sort of reason to do that, we're going to lose people. And so I really think that, uh, again, the best thing we can do is tell our message through stories and localize it to the area and the people, uh, the audience who we're talking to. Some people think that, well, what I'm saying is we need to change our message. No, again, that what, what we're doing is we're making that uh, message, uh, we're localizing that message so it actually um, uh, is impactful with the people that we're talking to so people can understand it and it, it's re it relates to them in their lives, right? I think the, the piece that we miss oftentimes is we believe that 
um, the way we talk about things is going to connect with everyone everywhere we go. And again, we have to localize it. We have to personalize it. We have to make sure there's um, uh, it, that that people are feeling that we are standing up and fighting for them. And that's the other piece of it, particularly in rural Minnesota. I don't think their values have changed. I think they feel, I know this because I talked to a lot of folks in rural Minnesota. I think they feel like they don't have champions anymore. They don't see us in their, in, uh, they don't see themselves in our calculus because we're not talking about them, or at least they don't feel like we're talking about them. And so Oftentimes, I, I believe that, you know, so much of voting uh, is really about how people feel. Uh, it's not necessarily specific to um, any one issue, but it's a general feeling people have about who's actually who actually cares about them and who's going to fight for them. And so we have to be present. That's the other part of communication, which is bizarre, uh, but maybe it makes sense to all of you, which is, you know, a message delivered from St. Paul. Uh, doesn't uh, really resonate with people uh, if you're not present in their community delivering it to people in Worthington or Marshall or uh, somewhere else, right? And so that means we have to be present in community. And when I have people in greater Minnesota tell me, well, we don't knock on doors and talk to voters. We march in parades. That's how we uh, campaign. It drives me bonkers because what they're basically saying is we're afraid to have conversations with people on the doors, right? And I think the best way that we can reverse the trend in greater Minnesota is be, uh, to be present in and having conversations directly, not just, you know, holding picnics and, and doing parades. All that's important. Don't get me wrong, but that's not going to change hearts and minds. What's going to change hearts and minds is having difficult conversations with people, not just about their hopes and aspirations, but also their fears and, and letting people People know how the Democratic Party is fighting for them on the things that they're concerned about. Easier said about, than done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and 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 then think about you know on the, in the rural issues, what did uh, Jane Kleb do? She was there. She was there to find That's out right. that the that the farmers were as upset about Keystone. Uh, if she hadn't been there, she wouldn't have known that. That's and right. so being out there and doing that is important. Also making those connections. I'm a, I live in a suburb of Minneapolis. I joined the rural caucus. I encourage everybody to make friends. Uh, uh, we don't meet in person as much with the SEC anymore, but that's, you know, when we do that again, it's important to take time to go meet people, walk across the room and talk to somebody from some other place and see how they're doing, make friends and then do what you can to help out. It's uh it's it's so important. So yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Ken. We're not changing our message. We're, uh, you know, when we talk about healthcare, you know, the hospital down the street from from me isn't going to close. The clinic near me isn't going to close. The one out in Worthington is going to close at some point. I'm, I'm just making I'm picking names here. I don't I don't know that you're going to lose your clinic in Worthington. Sorry, but. Uh, uh, but that's the kind of thing that it's the same message. Healthcare is a mess, and we can make healthcare easier. Uh, Virginia Stark, and I don't know if she's on here, had had a great frame for healthcare. She said, "Healthcare made easy." That's mm -hmm. what Democrats are looking for. Everything about it is hard, but when you're speaking to people in rural areas, talk about what's hard for them and how our policies fix that. And you can apply that to, to other other that's messages right. too. That's exactly right. What else do we have here? We have well, a lot of questions. I to say too that um, that uh, a couple a couple months ago, I did a webinar here on communication and talked about the half of communication is you listening and really listening, and the listening is so important to really make connections with people. So I'm glad you brought that up, Ken. Um, another question here. Is there a way to legalize marijuana through st statewide ballot initiative referendum? I'm worried about the Minnesota GOP funding and using the legalized marijuana candidates to undercut our DFL candidates. They took 5% of the vote that could have gone to Tina Smith in 2020. That's a significant margin. for statewide. Yeah, look, I, I, I have been saying this well before the uh, major party, uh, major pop parties became uh, major parties in the state that we needed a ballot uh, initiative on this. I think we're a little past that now in this cycle. It's not likely to get out of the legislature. As you know, a ballot 
initiative does not need a governor's signature, but it does need super majorities in the legislature to pass onto the ballot. We're not going to be there in an election year. The Republican Senate rec recognizes that one of our Achilles heels is the fact that these pop party candidates are actually siphoning votes off from the left. It's very disappointing because if you talk to the pop party chairs, as I have frequently, they will tell you <laughs> and they recognize that ironically, uh, them being major party status was probably the one thing that cost us the Senate and actually stood in the way of us legalizing it through state law. Uh, our whole party is unified on this. Uh, we support full legalization rec of recreational cannabis in this uh, state. I just came from New Mexico and was talking to their uh, governor down there, and uh, they are legalizing that just in the next few days. They will have full recreational uh, cannabis use uh, legalized in, in New Mexico. Many states throughout the country are heading that way. Uh, we, to, to the question, I don't think, unfortunately, we're going to be able to see that this year. But I'll tell you what, if we win the Senate back, and we have the trifecta. Governor Walls will sign that bill. Speaker Hortman and the House Caucus are there. And if we get the Senate back, the Senate will be there as well. And then we can do the right thing on that issue. But um, I unfortunately think it's going to continue to be a problem for us this cycle. And there will be a number of close races that will probably be decided by that, unfortunately. Ken, do you think the, the chairs you've spoken to have realized what's going on in their party when the Republicans come in to support a candidate? Are they reacting to that in any way? Are they some are. Some are. I mean, I think, you know, there's only so much you can do, right? Um, the problem with the major party status in this state is um, it's a very low threshold, and that has to be changed. Uh, right. You only need 5% on any statewide ballot to achieve major party status. Uh, that is very, very low. And, um, and, and we've seen the results of that now, because once you get major party status, what does that mean? It's not just the public sub subsidy and the money that comes along with it, it's ballot access. If you don't have major party status, you can only um, get uh, uh, access to the ballot through signatures. Right. You can't come in and just pay your filing fee. Well, now that you have uh, major party status, anyone can come in, pop down a check and file underneath the, your banner. And that's the real challenge here. And so it's very hard for local units to stand in the way of someone who wants to file as a pot party. Now we research all these people. And of course you all know, cause you saw many of those stories from the cycle uh, in the 2020 cycle, m many of those candidates, not all, but many of those candidates were recruited by the Republicans. Some were actually paid to run under that banner with the hopes of siphoning off votes. And in, in many cases that, that that's what happened, so. Maybe we need to bring Hubert Humphrey back and we've become the Democratic Farmer, Labor and Pot Party. <laughs> <laughs> or we could be the DFLL, the Democratic Farmer, Labor and Legalized Party. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Just a thought. Put that in your in your nature notebook. <laughs> yeah. What else do we have here, Lise? I think that's it for Oh, we need uh, better ways. Uh, there's a lot of comments in here, so I'm kind of sorting through them, but uh, we need better ways to get the unorganized townships involved. Any suggestions? Organize. I mean, I, we need unit leaders out there to actually help organize some of those areas, right? And, um, you know, I know it's hard, particularly in greater Minnesota, but, um, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges we're having as a party, I don't know the answer to this, to be honest with you, um, I'd be interested in 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 um, your guys' thoughts is we have a very aging volunteer base and particularly in greater Minnesota, we've had chairs, some chairs who've been doing it for 20, 25 years and they want to pass the torch. But, you know, it's a function of population loss in greater Minnesota uh, and also uh, young people just generally being busy in their lives and not as connected to political parties. And so we, as a result, the infrastructure, uh, not just in Minnesota, but throughout the country is very aging, right? And we're all getting older and not able to do as much uh, uh, as we used to. And so I worry about that. And as a result, it doesn't allow us to to uh, really do as much of that organizing, deep organizing that we should in places that are unorganized townships or other more rural, hard to reach areas of the state. Um, so we need to do better on that. And part of that is we need a renaissance of, of uh, new people involved, not just young people, but new people who we can pass the torch to. And I see one more question in there and then I'll have one after that. Uh, but how can we get more young people and people of color into the party? 
I think is always a good question. Well, I mean, I know Brianna, and I hope she's still on. I, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that. And I'm really interested in working uh, with people like Brianna and Sam Doton and others who are trying to find pathways to new people to get involved in the party. Um, I think it's important, as I mentioned earlier, that folks who uh, want to challenge the party do it from inside, right? And push the party to be better, to help us evolve on issues, right? Um, and I, I think that's a critical piece of making sure that people, uh, young people in particular, know uh, that this is their home, is that um, we welcome them into the party. Um, but the second piece of it is, is we need to actually um, uh, make sure that we recognize that young people just generally, uh, they're very animated by issues. They're not animated by party or candidates. And so when we have an appeal to them based on, hey, you need to support the DFL party, that's not going to work. I think one of the things that Bernie did so well, and you've heard me say this before, how in the hell did a 70-year-old grumpy you know, Jew from Vermont um, connect with all these young people? It wasn't because he was a great orator. He's a terrible speaker. Uh, it was because he was bold on the issues. He was talking about the issues people cared about, right? And particularly young voters. So what I, I mean by that is that if we as a party are going to connect with voters, uh, particularly young voters, we have to be bold on the issues and we have to meet them where the voters are at. I really believe that. And young people are not going to be uh, convinced to vote for the party just because it's the Democratic Party or shamed into it or just vote for a candidate because they're running under our banner, particularly if that candidate doesn't represent their issues. So we have to recognize and acknowledge that. And then we have to build support with young people around the issues that they care about. One last question, because I know you we're getting close to 830. You need to get on a plane tomorrow morning. So you're probably, I'm, I'm thinking we're probably the last thing you're doing today. It um, is, but I'm, I'm happy to be here. I always like uh, visiting with you guys. Uh, I appreciate that. So my last question is, is you're the hardest working man in show business. Do, do you ever take any time off? <laughs> Not as much as my wife would like, I'll tell you that much. But no, it's, uh, listen, I don't complain about this job. I feel very fortunate. I see my good friend, Ron Wax here. Ron remembers me when I was a, a young, uh, very young organizer working for this party. And so uh, I love this party. Good, bad, ugly. I love this party. I love the work. There's days uh, where it is definitely a slog, but I'll tell you, there's not one day, George, and this is the God's honest truth that I don't get up uh, and I'm excited to, to do this job. I feel very fortunate to be able to, to do this work. And um, there's, there are, there is a lot of taxing pieces to this. Um, and I'll tell you, um, uh, as I've always said to my fellow colleagues as they're elected, this is a job where you get none of the credit and all the blame, and you just have to know that <laughs> it's the political equivalency of being a fire hydrant. And I, 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 after 11 years, I have sort of uh, accepted that piece of it. But truly, George, that I, this is an honor of a lifetime to be able to lead this great DFL party and, and to continue the work that I was doing as a young man with people like Ron and others on this call. So thank you for having me tonight. I really appreciate it. Well, we're lucky to have you too. So that's great. All right, Ken, we'll go get some sleep. Connectionslab.org.